First up is uh, Janice Mansfield, and she's going to be talking about everything in moderation. Are we entering a new temperance era? Um, so I have notes, um, because those of you who know me know I do tend to digress a little, if not, uh, not kept on track. Um, but uh, thanks, for, thanks again for another great year of conference, Chris. Uh, the topics uh, that I've sat in on thus far have been really great. Love the diversity of them. So I'm going to talk about temperance, and um, it was suggested that perhaps I bring cocktails, but um, I wasn't sure if Chris had a liquor license or not, so sorry, there's no 10 o'clock whiskey sours this morning. <laughs> uh, those of you who know me know that I enjoy a cocktail or two. My personal philosophy in life is that life is too short to uh, not enjoy the food and drink we consume. I'm lucky to work in the food and beverage industry and as part of that um, have had the opportunity to amass a rather large uh, stock of alcoholic products to satisfy my need to tinker and experiment with new cocktail combinations. Um, just a disclaimer here, um, some of you may be offended by what I have to say, some of you may not, but uh, in the spirit of what Rose uh, talked about yesterday in terms of breaking the rules, um, I'd just like to uh, put some of my thoughts out there that perhaps challenge conventional wisdom about how we think about this particular product, alcohol. A couple of things have transpired in the last uh, couple of years and months that have got me thinking about how we think about liquor and prompted this talk today. Over the past couple of years, I've been observing uh, with some interest the liquor laws and regulations all over North America becoming more and more restrictive, ostensibly to reduce the uh, incidence of drunk driving, but ultimately inching towards zero tolerance policies, towards drinking altogether, not just while driving. Over the past few months, I'm also personally encountering more and more people, um, often male, often friends of my husband's, often married, um, who feel that they can only enjoy a splash of single malt whiskey in the safety of my home. <laughs> They're made to feel like lushes if they uh, choose to indulge while at their own homes. I've also found that when I talk to people about cocktails and about the uh, liquor repository I have in my home, uh, I often um, get concerned stares. <laughs> the impressions go from ones of, she seemed like such a nice person, <laughs> to when I tell them that I have over 100 bottles in my liquor cabinet of, uh, of various sorts, um, becomes one of, uh, perhaps she has a problem. <laughs> but it's never actually tacitly spoken. Never spoken but implied. In fact, this is kind of the impression <laughs> that I'm left with that people think of me. What I find interesting is that while I view this as my liquor library and have the capacity to whip up a cocktail or two in the same way that I do for cooking uh, food recipes, uh, most people don't actually feel the same. Were I, show pe were I to show people my pantry full of spices, um, it usually elicits admiration. And uh, people, in fact, are impressed with my foodie prowess and perhaps even impressed at how much I might have spent for some of this exotic Spanish saffron. $75 for an aged, a bottle of aged balsamic is seemed as, uh, as desirable and something to uh, strive for, yet $75 for a bottle of uh, fine sipping rum is seemed as indulgent. How did we come to this point? Are we entering a new temperance era? Are we headed for a neo-prohibitionist movement? How did a substance that was essential for the very survival of mankind become so maligned? The original bread of life was probably, in fact, a beer-like product. And the revered brandies of France are actually called eau de vie, water of life. In fact, plain old H2O was something that could have killed you. And so we owe our very existence of modern civilization to the fact that people were able to make fermented alcoholic products out of grains and out of fruits. So let's take a little trip back to ancient Greece. These guys enjoyed a mug of wine, a flagon, a jug, and actually left a little bit of a trail about how they thought about it. Wine, in fact, and the consumption of it was a distinguishing hallmark of Hellenic society, and the consumption of wine was what they felt set them apart from the barbarians. Wine was used as currency, but was also an important uh, ingredient in many civic and religious rituals, and certain wines were felt to have specific healing properties. Wine also played an important role in business and political dealings. Oratory, for example, was something that was considered best done when slightly buzzed. <laughs> it 
Here's an interesting little factoid as well. Uh, people who abstained from wine drinking in ancient Greece were viewed with some suspicion. So total teetotalers were actually felt to have a certain stench that would uh, leave their compatriots, uh, cause their compatriots to actually leave the bathhouse when they entered. The Greeks even created the symposium. So in fact, a lot of business actually got done in the symposium, a social structure that actually had its own room. So much like our modern dining rooms, uh, symposiums were created where people could come together, now this being Greek, uh, males. And um, there were, but there were some rules where um, this was an egalitarian space where everybody was free to, uh, to bring forward their ideas, much like we're doing here today. Um, food and drink were enjoyed freely in these spaces and uh, scintillating oratory and conversation took place. Uh, sometimes the libations were felt to actually enhance the philosophical discussions that were taking place. And the ultimate rule of the symposium was much like Vegas. What happens in the symposium stays in the symposium. So if we fast forward to the 21st century, um, we've gone through the heady days of the three martini lunch that uh, you see with sort of the, depicted in Mad Men. Uh, we've had the, uh, the raucous Studio 54 days, and these are the kind of headlines that we're seeing. So it's an interesting dichotomy. You're hearing sort of anecdotal reports um, conflicting often about the supposed health benefits of red wine. Uh, but these kinds, of, um, these kinds of headlines are actually hitting uh, popular media, mainstream media, with just as much frequency, if not more. So we've got alcohol more dangerous than heroin. Our youth are out of control. Canada must curb binge drinking, and alcohol is to blame. Even the doctors are in on it, so this is from the BBC. And in case you thought that you were safe because you actually didn't binge drink, social drinking's a problem too. And Dr. Phil's on it. Um, how do we stop teenage binge drinking? So you know it's really bad when Dr. Phil's uh, <laughs> spending whole segments on it. Add up the number of organizations that are all conveying the anti-drinking anti message, and it is one that has shifted from anti-drunk driving to anti-drinking. Um, you're saying, well, perhaps you're just being paranoid. I think the booze has gone to your head, Janice. Um, just for shits and giggles, um, I actually um, keyed in anti-drinking British Columbia, and the first thing that comes <coughs> up on the Google page is the BC liquor stores, the About Us page. So what's a little neo-prohibitionism among friends? After all, shouldn't we feel warm and fuzzy that someone really cares about whether I go down in a drunken stupor? Well, I would argue we actually live in a democratic society. I'm not advocating the wanton abuse and misuse of alcohol, but last time I checked, alcohol was actually a substance we're legally allowed to consume. As adults in a democratic society, shouldn't I have the right to enjoy a Manhattan without people looking at me askance? Am I not to be trusted to make responsible choices for myself and my family? Today's neo-temperance movement and attitudes are more veiled and subversive than in the 18th century and the 19th century. But make most, no mistake, they're there all right. The solutions to the problem of alcohol consumption, but unspoken at this point, suggest pricing controls and taxation as reasonable. So um, this is. William Hogarth's painting, Beer Street and Gin Alley. Um, so just to sort of t hop in the time machine and go back a little bit, um, if we look at the gin craze in the early 18th century, actually took five different taxation changes over 15 years before the horrible effects of Madame Geneva actually uh, abated somewhat. And there is some um, evidence that suggests that in fact it was rising grain prices, grain prices rather than the success of those taxation policies that actually caused people to trade back to drinking beer over gin. We fast forward to the late 19th century when the temperance movement began gaining some steam. It all began, uh, it all began innocently enough with people concerned about poverty. And you started to see propaganda like this, marching beer barrels <laughs> and whiskey barrels talking about uh, the, perils of, uh, the perils of alcohol against progress, poverty, crime, insanity, criminal behavior, and my favorite, wasting grain. 
This quickly grew from a practical discussion about public policy implications to a moral stance whereby women in the Women's Christian Temperance Union, for example, were pitching worst case scenarios to other women about the slippery slope that a single drop of alcohol could lead to, as in the drunkard's progress, the untimely death and the sobbing mother and child standing, at the, standing in the wake of it all. The cause and effect connections in some of these propaganda pieces bear a striking simil similarity to some of the scientific studies being brought forward by very, various neo-prohibitionist organizations today. They, they bear the same histrionic call for abstinence that we see in some of the talk, sh talk TV shows. If you think I'm being unfairly melodramatic about all this, I would note for you the Anti-Saloon League, which was directly responsible for drafting the Volstead Act of 1920 in the United States, is in fact still in existence today, operating under the more benign moniker, the American Council on Alcohol Problems. Soon frowning women were threatening the withholding of affection from their husbands. <laughs> who dare not enjoy a sip of whiskey, passive-aggressive behavior similar to those I found amongst the beleaguered male visitors to my home. <laughs> and it all ended horribly in uh, Carrie Nation wielding her hatchet and destroying good beer and whiskey. I suggest before we return to the hatchet-wielding hatchet stage of the neo-prohibitionist cycle, we consider a more reasoned approach to alcohol, that of the ancient Greeks. As with everything, to do, everything else to do with our corporeal selves, we've taken alcohol far too seriously and forgotten it's something that can be used for enjoyment. <clears throat> Consumed appropriately, it can help level the social strata playing field, allow the thoughts to flow a little more freely, and quite frankly, it makes a delicious cocktail. I'm suggesting a return to the symposium with one important addendum, let the girls in. <laughs> The 20th, 21st century symposium would be a space where people who want to enjoy a tasty beverage can do so without judgment. A space where people who care about talking about the differences between uh, Carpano Antica versus Punti Mess as sw possible sweet vermouth combinations can do so and actually find other people who would be interested in having those conversations. Also, this might be a cocktail hacker space where costly ingredients could be shared and experimented with. Come and enjoy a cocktail with me.